Mostly it is time that has created this majestic place, endless flowing rivers of time. From space, it appears chiseled into the Arizona desert, 277 miles long, averaging 10 miles wide and one mile deep. A car driving 70 miles per hour along the river would need four hours to drive its length. The geologic story began almost two billion years ago when an ancient line of volcanic islands collided with North America, forming a mountain range that stood three miles above sea level. Grand Canyon's oldest rocks were created by pressure and heat 13 miles below Earth's surface. Millions of years of erosion eventually removed these 13 vertical miles of rock, leaving a featureless plain near sea level. Over the next 500 million years, shallow seas, rivers, and sand dunes left a two and a half mile thick layer of sedimentary rocks. These were ultimately uplifted, faulted, tilted, and mostly removed in a second period of mountain building and erosion. Nearly a vertical mile of colorful sediment was laid down along seas, rivers, and sandy deserts. Corals, sponges, and reptile tracks were fossilized in the layers. Other layers containing dinosaur fossils were piled on top of the future Grand Canyon. But these rocks were subjected to erosion beginning 70 million years ago when uplift of the modern landscape began. Erosion completely removed the dinosaur age rocks. And only six million years ago, the modern Colorado River carved this enormous canyon. And the canyon is still deepening, averaging the thickness of a piece of paper each year. Humans first arrived near Grand Canyon between 8,000 to 12,000 years ago. Early inhabitants were nomadic, surviving by hunting and gathering. But by 2,500 years ago, people known as the ancestral Puebloans began irrigating, growing maize, and making settlements. We call them the basket makers. Perhaps with their success came something else. Outsiders. Existing on the rim of the canyon, their villages would have been hard to defend. downward into the canyons, changing their way of life forever. They migrated with the seasons between the rim and the sheltering depths below. Here they thrived. They crafted ceramic pots to hold corn, squash, and beans. They even brewed beer. They built structures into cliff sides, providing protection from above. <laughs> and they created 
art to illustrate the stories of their lives, which can still be seen today. It was a stable, thriving society in harmony with the natural world. And yet by the year 1300, it had vanished. Whether due to decades of drought, attacks by outsiders, or both, the ancestral Puebloans abandoned their homes here forever, leaving behind an enduring legacy. Just a blink in the flow of geologic time, 250 years is long in human terms. It was not until 1540 that the first European explorers arrived. Spanish conquistador. Garcia Lopez de Cardenas was on a mission seeking a large river rumored to exist north of the Pueblo of Cibola. After 20 days of tough travel with native Hopi guides who had purposely slowed his journey, he found the river. But with steep cliffs and little food or water left, he could not reach it. The muddy river below looked Colorado, Spanish for colored red, the name we still use today. The Hopi strategy succeeded, and Spanish hopes of penetrating the canyon to reach the river were abandoned. It was almost 275 years before American mountain man, James Ohio Patti, arrived. Patti's bigger-than-life adventures seemed like a tale from a dime novel. He fought grizzlies and mountain lions, was attacked by a Comanche war party, and helped rescue kidnapped young Spanish women being marched naked to their village. years after James Ohio Petit's arrival, there came another small group of adventurers. Traveling on an uncharted river, they plunged straight into a struggle for survival they could never have imagined. John Wesley Powell, surveyor, scientist, and one armed veteran of the American Civil War, undertook a perilous journey. He and his nine crew members and hard to maneuver robots had little whitewater experience or any knowledge of what lay ahead. Dedicated to a scientific mission of discovery, Powell kept detailed journals but his voice in the journals often sounded more like a poet than a scientist. The Grand Canyon is a land of song. 
Mountains of song swell in the rivers. Hills of music billow in the creek. And the meadows of music murmur in the rills that ripple over the rocks. We find fountains bursting from the rock high overhead. And the spray and the sunshine form the gems that bedeck the wall. The stream is still quiet, and we glide along through a strange, weird, grand region. The tables of rock, plateaus of rock, the thousands of strangely carved forms. In the long, gentle curves, the river winds about these rocks. The exploration was not made for adventure, but purely for scientific purposes. Beds of different colored formations run in parallel bands on either side. The perspective, modified by the undulations, gives the bands a waved appearance. And the colors gleam in the midday sun with the luster of satin. wider today. The walls rise to a vertical height of nearly 3,000 feet. We are three quarters of a mile in the depths of the earth, and the great river shrinks into insignificance. As it lashes its angry waves against the walls and cliffs that rise to the world above, they are but tiny ripples, and we but pygmies running up and down the sands or lost among the boulders. In many places, the river runs under a cliff in great curves, forming amphitheaters, half domed shape. This evening, as I write, the sun is going down and the shadows are settling in the canyon. The vermilion gleams and roseate hues blending with the green and gray tints are slowly changing to somber brown above, and black shadows are creeping over them below. We have an unknown distance to run, an unknown river to explore. What falls there are, we know not. What rocks beset the channel, we know not. What walls ride over the river, we know not. Seventy-nine days on the river had left its toll. One man had fled the expedition. One boat was wrecked. Most of the food lost or moldy, and little game to hunt. The boats were battered as were the men, and the morale was low. Yet they had only begun the worst of their journey.
In all, Powell and the men would eventually face 360 rapids, once running 35 rapids in only 14 miles. At almost every stop, the boats had to be recalled to prevent leaking. Sometimes the boats had to be carried by hand. Sometimes eased down shallow rapids with ropes. Their flour had to be sifted and dried again and again. They had only 15 pounds of bacon left for nine men. And other food had washed away. Their clothing was wet and ragged. Now some of the men refused to go on. Three men believed the mission was doomed and madness to carry on. Knowing of settlements 75 miles away, they believed it would be safer to attempt the long walk. Powell thought the best course was to carry on down the river, but sent a copy of his important notes and a letter to his wife with the three men, hoping one of the two groups would survive. To leave the exploration unfinished, to say there is a part of the canyon I cannot explore, having already almost accomplished it, is more than I am willing to acknowledge. And I determine to go on. survived the final rapid and were safe. The other three were never seen again. Powell's exploits made him a national hero, but he was not yet satisfied that he had fulfilled his mission. Only two years passed before Powell began a second voyage of discovery, bringing with him someone whose work would reveal Grand Canyon to the world. John Carl Hillers, a German oarsman with the second expedition, turned to photography to document the journey and the canyon's stunning landscapes. Beginning as an amateur, he was driven to extremes by this new passion. His images are stark, dramatic, and timeless.
beyond the beauty of nature. Hillers focused his lens on the native groups who lived in and near the canyon. From images of daily life, to posed portraits, his photographs gave a first glimpse to the outside world of the people who called this their home. Standing alone, he documented all he saw, but no photograph can really capture the primitive grandeur of this place. There have been many stories told of journeys in the canyon. As more adventurers entered the wilderness, human influence was inevitable. may have grown taller in the telling, but these tales and photographs made their way into the consciousness of the world. Now, many came to visit, to see for themselves. And so it was with President Teddy Roosevelt. The great outdoorsman was so moved by this unique place he began the process that would lead to Grand Canyon becoming a national park 16 years later. He declared, In the Grand Canyon, Arizona has a natural wonder, which is absolutely unparalleled throughout the rest of the world. Keep this great wonder of nature as it now is. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. But his cautionary words could not hold back people from everywhere. Workers, tourists, hotels, cars, and trains. The adventurous and the curious. The humble and the famous. different today, the canyon continues to draw people from around the world. From below, the waters and sheer cliffs are inviting and seem to call for exploration and adventure.
as night arrives, the sky above Grand Canyon reveals a spectacle few around our brightly lit planet can still see. Now designated as a dark sky park, constellations, planets, and the Milky Way are all on display. The ancestral Puebloans watch the night sky. They even built what might be a solar observatory. The Hopi believe three worlds existed before our modern one each ending with the arrival of a blue star. The Diné Se Coyote became impatient when First Woman was carefully placing stars in the sky and took a blanket full of crystals and flung them up into the heavens, making stars without names. With its rugged landscape, we may be tempted to forget that this place is also teeming with life. The great changes in elevation within the canyon create six distinct microclimates within its walls. Each change of 1,000 feet of elevation inside means a five and one half degree Fahrenheit difference. Insects, reptiles, birds, and mammals all live here sharing these diverse environments. From above, it is a panorama like no other. It seems to invite us to take wing and see for ourselves what time and the forces of our planet have created. For the native peoples to whom Grand Canyon is home, each with their own historic and deep relationship to this place, it is sacred space a belief that the land is itself a living being, sacred in all her parts. Grand Canyon is our unique inheritance, bestowed upon us to study and preserve.
Grace, John Wesley Powell wrote, the glories and the beauties of form, color, and sound unite in the Grand Canyon. Forms unrivaled even by the mountains. Colors that vibe with sunsets and sounds that span the diapason from tempest to tinkling raindrop, from cataract to bubbling fountain. Grand Canyon can humble us, force us to see how small we are. Yet it also can uplift our spirit, let us marvel at the world around us and find our own place in the endless rivers of time. <laughs>